feathers aren't just for birds, right? It's becoming increasingly obvious that a number of different organisms have feather-like appendages, or what we call skin appendages, or uh, keratinaceous uh, features. Um, think of it as like extended toenails. You think feathers that way. What about this new fossil right here? Is this a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a dinosaur? No, it's none of those. <laughs> it's a drapanosauromorph. Uh, drapanosauromorphs are neither uh, archaeosaurs, which would be your dinosaurs, um, your pterosaurs, and your, well, actually not pterosaurs, uh, your dinosaurs and your alligators, um, nor is it a lizard. It's a completely other separate group, lizard-like organisms that are actually bird-like in some ways as well, as we'll see. So what looks like a tiny a bird-faced lizard, I don't know if you can see the skull there in this new uh, recently described uh, Dyson, uh, sorry, Drapanosauromorph, almost called it a dinosaur, uh, has this flamboyant back crest. This is, a, this is just a wild feature uh, not seen in any other group uh, that's related to this particular organism. Uh, it's from the middle Jurassic. It has this feather-like, and you notice I, I'm saying feather-like, I'm um, not calling them actual feathers. It's kind of like, and, I, and I'm looking right at you, Carl Warner, who likes to say that just because a uh, scientist or a paleontologist calls something like something doesn't mean that's what they are, right? Uh, he's famous for you know, hearing beaver-like tail and then just assuming that beavers actually, they're, they're describing beavers. Uh, so we are not describing a bird here. We're not describing a dinosaur. We're describing a whole different organism, but it has this very interesting feature that is reminiscent of feathers and probably composed of the same material that feathers are composed of and probably used for some of the same purposes that feathers are used to, especially uh, used for, especially in dinosaurs, right? For display, uh, not for flight. Uh, what you're seeing here is not uh, something that flapped. All right, these are these are coming from the from the the spine, the anatomy, and where this particular fossil is found in the fossil record, and its uh, feather-like appendage. All right, present a real another classification puzzle for young Earth creationists who like to claim that anything with a feather is obviously a bird. All right, what separates everything from birds? Birds have feathers. But what if other organisms like pterosaurs and Tyrannosaurus rex and um, andropanosauromorphs have feather-like or even feathers? You know, new fossils like this, and this is an artistic uh, rendering of what this might look like. Now, there actually is evidence that there's melanosaurs, I'm sorry, melanosomes in these uh, feather-like appendages in the keratinaceous material that makes up this uh, fan-like back display. And melanosomes are are known to be uh, color, uh, you know, are, are, and melanosomes are known to be things that provide color in things. And so there's a very good reason to believe that they're these were very colorful uh, appendages, uh, and therefore probably used for display, maybe mating uh, or warning uh, calls. So this is yet additional evidence that complex, colorful, feather-like structures existed outside of birds and dinosaurs. This new, dis newly described species of uh, Mirasaura uh, is from the Middle Triassic about 247 million years ago uh, from eastern France. There's two partial skeletons that have been found and about 80 isolated crust elements that preserve both the bones and uh, soft tissues. Not that the actual soft tissue is preserved, but the impressions of these tissues have been found. So that is a preservation of a sort of soft tissues because it tells us something about the soft tissue present. So here's a couple drapanosauromorphs uh, that were described prior to this new one being described that has this, uh, this uh, appendage on its back. Uh, and it's been suggested that actually maybe these also had small appendages on their back. It was just not recognized in the fossil record or at least nothing that somebody had looked for when they originally described these. Um, they have sort of a superficial bird-like skull, these um, derpanosomorphs. Uh, they've got uh, probably a keratinaceous uh, beak-like um, structure and uh, large eyes, and they have really bizarre um, forelimbs. Uh, that's another characteristic that this sort of seems to be shared among the multiple different species that have been described within this particular group. And then along comes uh, Mirasaura, all right? 
And in, this is definitely, none of these are, are, are part of the bird line. And uh, they are not uh, archaeosauromorphies, uh, which are your, your dinosaurs and your, your uh, alligators and so forth, those types of, of reptiles. And going back to this reconstruction, so these, um, these particular Drapanosaurus lived in trees, and they have another interesting feature of them is they have prehensile tails, which means that they can uh, curl their tail around and hold on to things uh, with it. So think of this as a sort of a Triassic tree climber. I mean, the showstopper with this particular organism is this back crest, right? So they have overlapping appendages. Each one of those is overlapping and thought to be separate units. Uh, that have a central ridge. So it's like feather-like in its outline here. Uh, but they do lack sort of the branching barbs that would define like true feathers, um, advanced feathers. So, and chemically and ultra-structurally, they, uh, there's preserved, as I mentioned before, melanosomes, which are pigment granules, and, and they match very much shape, size, construction of those found in reptile skin, uh, mammalian hair, and feathers and birds. So you have that combination of non-feather anatomy plus feather-like pigmentation. Well, this strongly suggests that these were keratinaceous uh, display structures, as I mentioned before, not obviously not flight tools. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been some that have suggested, like uh, Mark Witten uh, on his blog, uh, suggested that the flattened-like uh, tail structures that are seen um, could have been uh, basically sail-like structures. Uh, and then there's also the possibility they had skin flaps between their legs, much like a flying squirrel. Uh, and so he suggests that being in trees, that they're actually, you know, potentially like tree squirrels, actually could could uh, sail or, you know, glide uh, from trees. And there are aspects of its anatomy that could be interpreted that way, but we don't yet have sort of the soft tissue preservation to show us that uh, some of these features, you know, were actually expressed in these particular organisms. But now they have... Now we see that you know some of these have these weird back uh, sails. Now that probably would not aid in, probably wouldn't aid in um, gliding, although I guess possibly. It seems much more reasonable to suggest that it is a, it is a display feature uh, in these organisms. So here we go. Here's the here's the, probably the the best version of some of the new fossils that have been discovered, uh, new individuals that have these uh, these back displays. You know, I think what this shows, what this new discovery shows, is that in a completely unrelated organism, unrelated to other animals that have uh, keratinous uh, uh, displays like some dinosaurs, which had uh, keratin, which appears to be on the surface of the, like their horns and other things like that that might have color in them, uh, is that uh, there is a suite of characteristics, right? At the molecular level, right, the ability to produce keratin can be expressed in different ways in different organisms, much like toenails can grow out into different uh, shapes and sizes and, and, and take on different functions in mammals. Uh, keratin in lizards, keratin in um, pterosaurs, you know, keratin in dinosaurs and keratin in uh, production in birds uh, take on different forms. I guess you could say this new fossil is pointing out that the genetic machinery uh, underlying complex skin appendages like feathers, like hair, you know, like beta keratin structures, you know, it predates birds. It was around before birds. And uh, so birds evolved in an environment in which there was already sort of the molecular capacity, right? The, the genetic capacity to produce um, this type of material. And then simply tweaking, you know, the expression of that material produces something uh, like feathers. That's the thing that Answers in Genesis struggles with is trying to is understanding uh, that uh, progressive pattern, right? They they'll they'll say that dinosaurs don't have feathers, but of course they have to define feather in a certain way. So they define feathers in sort of modern feathers. They don't want to define feathers like this, all right, where these are keratinaceous. Um, uh, uh, what are they called? Keratinaceous um, pigno fibers, right? Pigno fibers, I think. Um, so it's like this fibrous uh, material that's being produced out of this what was or scales have turned into these long fibers. Uh, think of them as uh, feathers without the the quills, right? Uh, without the I'm sorry, feathers without the barbs. 
this is you what is this this is eudosaurus this is at the uh um down at a natural history museum down in columbus and you know the whole there's pretty decent evidence that this very large clearly clear dinosaur in all of its the rest of its anatomy is covered with this you know these pycnofibers which are uh keratin and so therefore an expression of something that's feather like uh as well uh but answers in genesis young earth creationists will say well those aren't true feathers so only only birds have true feathers they will accept that there's other you know <laughs> there are other much more dinosaur like things that have even true feathers and they have this lizard that has you know an expression of something very similar to a feather as well all right so like you know i mean well here look this is a image from answers in genesis of something that's t-rex like and it has those fibers on it you know it's like and it's like saying there's keratin fibers on this particular large dinosaur those aren't feathers uh, whereas these other organisms running around, which uh, which scientists say are dinosaurs, seem to have real feathers. Although they say there's no chance that, as you say, like that that T. Rex couldn't have become that particular other bird. All right, which they classify as birds, even though they're more dinosaur-like than they are birds. Uh, it's just the feathers that are the important thing there in terms of their classification. Um, but of course, they're also you know, suggesting that T-Rex became a chicken, which, you know, no evolutionary biologist uh, suggests that uh, T-Rex itself became birds. It's just a separate lineage that also has bird-like characteristics. So I, I wanted to add a little bit about the distribution because this is another challenge to young earth creationists, uh, another fossil yet that sort of like raises more questions than it, than it, uh, that it answers for young earth creationists. Um, Mirasaurus is only found in Eastern France, but Drapanosaurus are a group that's been found widely. I mean, there's multiple different species, some of which have been uh, identified through uh, multiple different locations and multiple different sets of material. So it's not just like, hey, I found one bone, one tooth, that type of situation we have. And so the rest of the Drapanosaurus, like I said, are found across Loretta. Well, Laurasia is pretty much the uh, the north of the equator, everything that's north of the equator a long, long time ago, uh, is a an, an old continent uh, of everything across uh, that was north of the equator uh, that had distinct terrestrial environments, mostly in the Triassic. Uh, that's all of Europe, a little bit of Asia and North America. And so these fossils are widespread, uh, but found in a very thin section of the geological column. And so that's another amazing thing that uh, about the fossil record uh, that just seems to, uh, in my mind, just defies the, the conventional geological explanation for that young earth creationists have of flood geology. How do all these tree dwelling organisms, right, all get trapped in sediments only in one little section of the fossil record, except that little section of the fossil record is spread across a very vast area, right? And that distribution just doesn't fit the chaotic description of a vast global flood that's just sorting and, and mixing all the organisms up at all. Now, right, let's wrap this up. Like Answers in Genesis, they argue that if feathered dinosaurs existed, they must have been created as birds, not evolved from reptiles. In other words, they just define them. They're actually birds. Mirasaur, yet is another example that just demonstrates a different reality than what young earth creationists are attempting to say. Feathered-like display tissues have evolved in reptile lineages outside of birds and dinosaurs. They exist outside of birds. Calling all such structures bird feathers misclassifies the anatomy and ignores like all the other developmental evidence uh, from these fossils. Taxonomy that's based on single traits right? Something is featherish and therefore that's the thing that puts them into that category. It just breaks down when you get in, when you see independent evolution of similar like features on multiple different types of organisms. Systematics, the, the process of identifying and, and uh, systematically trying to understand the diversity of life and classify it, all right, is going to try to weigh multiple different characters, not just a single phylogenetic feature. Yeah, so another really fascinating critter, like we're always finding new things, right? And we're finding out that features that once were thought to be exclusive of one particular group can often be found um, in other groups. 
Now, when they're usually found in other groups, they're not exactly the same. Because even though they might come from a common architecture of sort of like the genetic apparatus for making keratin is present, um, they're going to uh, be, they're going to have evolved in different environments and had different mutations, uh, had different pressures upon them, and kind of up with their own unique expressions. And so we shouldn't be surprised to find organisms that have unique architectures uh, that use similar foundational elements. Um, but put them to work in different ways, in different environments. Uh, this won't be the last organism that we find that uh, has some kind of display feature that is feather-like uh, and has similarities to feathers. I'm sure there are more out there waiting for us to find. Uh, and I look forward to, that is really, this is a really cool critter. Um, well, that's it. I just uh, just wanted to share uh, the Derpanosauromorphs uh, with you. Um, thanks. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.